sure that there's this general interest in, 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 in my tie. Uh, this is a, uh, a necktie that uh, takes, in fact, the great plan of Rome from 1748 um, that was produced by Piranesi's uh, contemporary, uh, Giovanni Battista Nolli. Uh, and um, that plan. <laughs> this doesn't happen in Princeton, does it? No. I could I could take it off and we could pass it around, uh, but but to um, not to to make a, a kind of pedantic um, uh, discourse on you know an article of clothing, the 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 the, the city plan that you see here um, uh, is obviously uh, transferred to fabric from uh, a map that was originally printed on paper using the same techniques that were uh, used by Piranesi. And in fact, Piranesi collaborated with Noli, the map maker, on um, a number of different projects. So that uh, it seemed to me appropriate uh, for the, uh, the, the conference. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I'm not sure that I can come up with a question quite as, as um, entertaining as, as that uh, of the necktie. But since Jeffrey's late getting back to the table, I think I'll um, put him on the spot first. And, and I was thinking, you know, with this, I think, really engaging, brilliant idea that Piranesi is not apart from tradition, that he is very much part of the world of French Rococo and, and 18th century um, more is more designed generally. But a question that I would ask of you, or really of all three of you, is, is what does make Piranese different, though? I mean, even if he is clearly tied to all of these sources, even if he is using them, is, is he doing something different as a designer um, from all of his contemporaries? Could I start? Yeah, absolutely. And is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. You know, um, I think there'd be many ways to answer that, but let me go back to one of the first examples that I used, which was that um, candelabrum that I was trying to liken to a French Rococo prototype. I mean, in a way that's a little unfair because that type of design with vegetal or organic inspiration really pervades, it pervaded design in 17th century, it was there in the 16th century, and it obviously survives in the 19th century. I think what makes Piranesi different from the example of a Beaufort that I showed is that he's trying to rationalize it. And, and there are some preliminary sketches for that candelabrum that really show he, he's not only interested in the ultimate sort of sinuous curve that a French Rococo designer might be, but he wants to really ground it in a theory of the generation of form from nature. Um, in a sort of systematic way. And he's working out how he can make uh, a tree branch shaped candelabrum that fits his theory of what architecture and design actually is. So although it ends up looking you know, superficially Rococo, in a sense, that's, I'm, I'm cutting over some stages there. Uh, and I think it's, it's that attempt to root 18th century practice in a new synthetic theory of what design actually is that, that makes him distinctive. So it's, it's both in the specific object and then the constellation of objects together that offer, in a sense, a new vision of thinking about form. Well, I, I would add um, that while uh, it, w one of the indices that we use to measure novelty is, of course, the degree to which a given design or a given designer departs from convention. And uh, certainly in, in, in that index, Piranesi is, um, is, is very high up on the scale. He was, throughout his career, concerned and passionate about the examples from the past that broke the rules. He preferred those to the examples that conformed to the rules. And one way of viewing his whole um, theoretical enterprise was to really to bring these examples that broke the rules together in order to construct an argument and a justification for innovation and novelty. And that's, that, 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 would be, um, uh, that would be my response. Uh, a desire to move away from uh, the conventional and traditions um, that in his view, theoretically, um, the past was inhibiting and constraining contemporary, his contemporaries, contemporary art, from 
uh, producing new forms. And, and so the past, he argued, should be all about stimulating new forms. Can, can I, and I just want to pick up on that yet again. Um, if you read the Piranesi literature, there's a, always an attempt to situate his theories and his designs against the Greco-Roman debate, which of course was pervasive in 18th century Rome, but there were many other debates going on. And I think what John is getting at, some of the comparative examples I showed of other designers, other architects like Carlo Marchionni, who are do, advancing the same kind of aesthetic, they're on one side of another debate in, within the architectural sphere in Rome, which is the sort of afterlife of Borromini, the great 17th century rule-breaking genius. And both Piranesi and Marchionni and others were very much on the side of those great Romans who in relatively recent history had broken the rules and saying, no, that's just fine and let's keep breaking them in those ways and even, even more. There were many others who, while not advocating only Greece, were against that kind of Invenzione. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think taking this example uh, forward to the present day and even to this exhibition, I think the exhibition is very much in that spirit of rule breaking. There are mm -hmm. a great many of uh, our colleagues um, at universities and museums in America who uh, have a real theoretical problem with the idea of an exhibition that includes not only Piranesi's own works, but these modern recreations or performances of them. But I think those performances help you understand Piranesi in the way that he helped or hoped that people would understand the past. I mean, I, I think there really is a, a kind of um, spirit to the exhibition that's consistent with the man's own powers of invention, uh, which is one of the reasons that I, I thought it, it would work well in a setting like this at our museum. All of you must have some questions. I'd like to just say one oh, thing yeah, sure. uh, about um, the question you posed, and it's sort of from the different side, and it's about reception. I think one of the things that makes Piranesi such an important, I mean, sort of world-class important uh, designer and everything else that he was, was the fact that his um, imagery transcended specific types of audiences. Um, it wasn't, as many French designers were, it wasn't simply for other designers. Um, or for architectural uh, firms and companies and things like that. It was basically a much broader uh, spectrum of, of reception, and that, I think, necessarily conditioned the public more than any other single source about what that form of neoclassicism is and should be, and that that form of neoclassicism could, al ooh, uh, could also be a part of an actual lived environment yeah. um, with relatively little uh, mediation. You have a question here. Um, with regard to your comments about rule breaking, is there any evidence that he was familiar with Vitruvius and the architectural, the Roman architectural manuals? Some of these works, in terms of how he's depicting proportion and scale, he's saying, Vitruvius, ah, what did he know? And I'm wondering if there was anything explicit where he is, he addresses that. Yes. Um, he's very explicit about that, um, and you characterize his attitude towards Vitruvius perfectly. Um, he, he never put it in, uh, in quite this way in so many words, but for him, Vitruvius was an incredibly conservative um, uh, rule, codifier of rules. Like Winkelmann. Um, yes, uh, an, an ancient Winkelmann, if you will, uh, and was, and, but, one way of looking, I think, at the history of, um, of much Renaissance architecture is to, uh, to identify a, a very lengthy period in which the text of Vitruvius was taken to be an absolute uh, guide to ancient architecture. And you see the efforts of whole generations of architects, uh, made perhaps culminating with Palladio, uh, to go out and find and to measure and to find the examples that will explain the text. And they're constantly frustrated because many of the examples don't conform to the text. It's Piranesi's genius, or one aspect of it, that he sees that that is in fact the great Roman contribution, um, that they did not build formulaically, uh, but they build uh, imaginatively. 
Could I add also, for those who might not know, Vitruvius is the one surviving Roman architectural treatise, but it's very early. Mm. And it, uh, part of the problem that John mentioned of this, these generations of architects trying to reconcile the text and the visual remains is that they, Vitruvius wasn't talking about the remains mm. that Piranesi was interested in. He was, these were much later, and right. so Vitruvius's rather Hellenic vision was not what interested him about Roman architecture, it was these colossal, magnificent, concrete space-forming structures that Vitruvius has little to say about. Is there any um, Piranesi image, I can't think of one, but you two know so much more, um, where, the Rome, where the ancient orders are used correctly? You, you, by correctly, you mean according, according to Vitruvius? According to Vitruvius. Oh, sure, yes, no, no. Um, in the Justificazione and in the Magnificenza, in yeah. particular, he, he, he sets them out, um, but, the, but, the, but in a very telling way, the, the way he sets them out is to show you that this is but one model and there are many others besides. Go yeah, he sets them out and then spends the next five pages showing you columns that don't fit right. those models and how those are actually more interesting. More interesting. When Same we, thing with capitals as well. Mm -hmm. You have standard and then many varieties. And, and when we break up here, go into the exhibition and find the plate that shows the ion, his, mm. his I, collection exactly of ionic right. capitals. And that's actually at sort of a palimpsest, and it's part of this Greco-Roman debate, because he pastes in the middle a page that seems to be an extract from Julien David's Loise, you know, the most beautiful ruins of Greece where he's championing the Ionic as, the, of course, the, the Greek Ionic is the most beautiful. And he quotes Leroy saying, the, the Roman examples of this order are sort of mean and poor and lacking in imagination. And then what Piranesi does around the sides is he shows you those Roman examples, which to his way of thinking, blow this Greek stuff out of the water. And so it's a very sarcastic yeah. comment on correctness versus yeah. the Romans would stick heads in the, in the volutes and you know, yeah, they make them sculptures. As a, as, as a bit of wayfinding, so those of you who have been in the exhibition or, or who are going to go, after you leave the room with the car tree video and you go down a kind of narrow hallway That's, sort of yeah. space, all in that hallway are the prints specifically about this question. Um, so yeah, it's all there. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. I'd like to ask, uh, Christopher mentioned that Piranesi's prints were more readily seen than a lot of other, or maybe people didn't see any illustrations. Um, how were they disseminated? You mentioned that the, if you were worthy, you got maybe a, a souvenir book from the Pope. But how would the average person find them? And was he the artist that actually made the plates, the production of the prints? Well, I'm, I'm sure John knows a lot more about that, but, and you can add to what, sure. I, or correct what I am about to say. Um, Piranesi had a business in Rome, um, and he oversaw the, uh, the copper, uh, the, the etching process and all of this. You could go in and buy these literally off the wall, sometimes already framed, other times loose, and then you would take it home and frame it. Um, we were talking earlier about um, a, a, an English ship that was taking back tons and tons of goods from grand tourists in Rome that was seized um, uh, by the Spanish, I think, um, uh, during... Actually seized by the seized French. Seized by the French. Oh, and sold, 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 sold. Sold. There you go. 1778. Um, yeah. But there were enormous quantities of Piranesi prints among just the luggage being shipped home. Uh, by some of these um, English grand tourists. So you could buy them, they could be given to you, uh, you could trade for them. Um, but again, it's, an, it's a business establishment intended to make money. In, in my lecture in a, in a few weeks called Purchasing Piranesi actually talks quite a bit about this practice and also about the Westmoreland and this cash materials. Could we, maybe also worth saying, the, the prints that are in the exhibition are, um, in a sense, the last version, the final statement. And so they're organized very much by publication, you know, as they were collected. But they weren't always generated that way. So the publication history of an individual print is quite complex. And you could buy single prints. You could have them uh, bound at your specification. And he was always adding to the series. So it's quite hard to pinpoint. Yeah. So the Antiquita Romane, were, it was, a, it was an, an endeavor that grew over the course of his business enterprise. They were in fact, I'm sorry, no, all sold fair? as oh, yeah. loose sheets. Sometimes you could buy a portfolio, but they're all sold as loose sheets. Most of them wind up in volumes because of the taxation system. So that right. when the English went to export their Piranese, if you had them bound in volumes, you paid a tax per bound volume. If they're individual sheets, you paid a tax per sheet. 
So it's 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 a. And he'd happily a, sell you a title page yeah. it, it, if you wanted to do that, and you saw several yeah. of them. But just just to extend the the, the mercantile uh, discussion here a little bit, he was really um, he bears absolute comparison with the most. Um, out there, contemporary artist, in terms of uh, uh, presenting his work uh, to the public. So to give you two examples, uh, he had arrangements with most of the uh, professional guides in Rome who would lead uh, tourists around uh, with the understanding that at the end of the circuit of, of itineraries, they would uh, bring their charges to the uh, to the shop. Although, to be fair, he was not the only artist in Rome. I was going to say, never. some things never change. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> I mean, the other thing that he did was he um, uh, quite frequently issued broadsides, printed broadsides, um, which listed his works. The precise price uh, for a print from each series, uh, the address uh, at which they might be acquired, um, all the information you needed to know. I mean, if there had been an internet, um, you know, uh, he would have been the first person on eBay uh, with, uh, with his, um, um, this, this enterprise. While the microphone's traveling, and I, I would just add that Christopher's comment to reinforce about these presentation volumes, they had a long afterlife, and I've spent a lot of my time rooting around the, the secret archive in the Vatican, and in between the bills for the papal laundry and the darning of the papal socks and all of this, you find bills for the acquisition of Piranesi prints long after his death to, to present to visiting dignitaries and bills for their binding. Um, each of you in your own turn mentioned the excavations that were going on and um, you know, the discovery of ruins was so important in the 1740s and 50s. And I wondered if you know, while he's running his proto-internet business and tourism, uh, being a commerce, com and tourism. Did Piranesi actually ever go to Herculaneum? Was he oh, yeah. like William Hamilton down there in the dirt, you know, at bargaining over the ruins? Can you speak a little bit more about not just his antiquarian business, but whether he was the, you know, that dirty dealer who was himself stealing the object from the dirt? More southern. You're I can't imagine William Hamilton ever down in the That's dirt. your question, <laughs> okay. John. Well, uh, l let me try to answer that with a couple of, of specific examples. Uh, first, um, uh, he uh, he would go. He went into partnership, famously, uh, with another dealer, um, uh, Hamilton, to excavate at Hadrian's Villa to extract the very fragments, which he then worked into those. Um, um, uh, marvelous objects, some of which uh, are on display here. And it, there's, a, there's a wonderful, I think for me, a, a quintessential 18th century anecdote. Um, the Hamilton, um, who had purchased the rights to dig in this place, um, was frustrated because he had assembled this group of workmen and they were digging away and they weren't finding anything. And um, this, uh, one day, it was a Sunday, uh, he was standing outside the chapel um, uh, that exists, still survives, uh, at Hadrian's Villa, uh, owned by the Count Fede, and there he met Piranesi, and he, he bared his soul to Piranesi. I have this problem. And Piranesi said, oh, well, I know this old guy who was around when digging more or less near that spot uh, went on uh, 30 or 40 years previously, we'll talk to him. So they talk to the guy, and all of a sudden they know where to dig, and out it comes. Um, he, um, his biographers describe um, him sleeping on a straw mattress in the ruins um, uh, repeatedly. Uh, his last great archaeological trip, the one down to Pestum, uh, again, I mean, he was suffering from um, uh, a bladder disease and in great pain, but we know that they, uh, they basically camped out. There was no other place to stay. So he was always, and, and in a way, that's what the Speaking Ruins, I think, reference uh, is, is all about. It's, it's getting your hands dirty and being there. Where uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum are concerned, yes, he, he, he did get to both sites. There are wonderful drawings, some of them at the Morgan Library, um, that represent um, his, uh, the records that he made, over 300 drawings, in fact, uh, among um, Pompeii, Herculaneum, and the Royal Museum at Portici, which his son Francesco later reworked and in, in 1804, 1806, issued a great book, basically, 
um, well, we won't say plagiarizing, but uh, recycling his father's uh, drawings. Thank you. Um, in the, I forget your name. Christopher. Yeah, Christopher. Uh, in your, t the title of your talk uh, had the word politics in it. I understand he was a good businessman, but what are the aspects of politics related to that period and related to uh, his mindset? I think the way Piranesi fits into the political uh, culture of, of Rome in the middle decades of the uh, 18th century, and this of course comes to a head during the reign of uh, 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 Clement the 13th, the Venetian who was, favored him and for whom he built the only really major building of his career as, as an architect, the church. It was a chapter, yeah, you said that Santa Maria del Priorato. Um, I think as a polemicist for the continuing vitality of Rome, that's not only um, a sort of a his, cultural historical statement, but it's also a political one. Uh, because during the middle of the 18th century, there were increasing attacks uh, from all, and largely from Catholic Europe as well as Protestant Europe. Um, about whether um, a sort of a priestly government uh, was actually an effective type of government, uh, the nature of revealed religion and its relationship to enlightenment ideas of, of empiricism and the rational. Um, this is the period when the church was reevaluating the nature of miracles that were required for the canonization making of saints. Um, so Piranesi's political uh, positioning in all this, not only superficially in terms of the presentation of his work to visiting uh, uh, dignitaries and all of that, which was, these were papal favors that were given to, uh, uh, to people, but it also makes a position statement, I think, about um, indirectly about the efficacy of papal government as a responsible curator of the city, um, uh, the preser as the preserver of past monuments, as the continuator and patron of, of, con of new uh, undertakings, uh, both buildings and other types of uh, visual expression, but also the idea of the preservation of the past. And of course, it, you know, one of um, uh, the most important uh, institutions in this period was in 1730s, uh, the establishment of the Capitoline Museum which was really the first institution of its type, which was specifically made uh, to preserve works from export, from being purchased, in other words, to create them as inalienable political property of the state, uh, but also um, as a means of improving public taste and, re and showing the, uh, the responsible curatorial aspect of pontifical government. So Piranesi fits in uh, to a lot, and is he a major political player? I wouldn't say that. But his polemical position was then deployed in a lot of different uh, 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 arguments that I think can best be characterized as political. Does that answer your question? Could, could I add just oh. a word? No, no, no. Absolutely. And to, to maybe back, step back even further, remember this is a period in which there is no nation of Italy. Um, Italy is a mosaic of tiny states, of which the Papal States is one. And there are people, this is the period in which efforts at constructing a national identity begin. It's the period in which uh, literary historians begin to collect the earliest examples uh, of, Ital of the Italian language. Uh, and the, on the visual side, this enterprise of documenting the magnificence of ancient Rome, I, I would say that a not so subtle subtext there is how can we use this example uh, to help us uh, return, if not to our time of, of imperial glory, to uh, uh, enjoy the, the opportunities for a national culture that we currently lack? And that, that really is an excellent question because it shows how hard it is for us to look at Piranesi's um, works either individually or collectively and recapture those historical nuances. So to come back to the example of the tripod from Portici, that was in a different country. Mm. Um, and so he was limited in what he was permitted to do, all, all of the things that Christopher was talking about, about preservation, the papal preservation of antiquities, that those laws didn't apply. There were different laws and different restrictions. But by transcending them and by making a volume that... Right, because, that, because no one other than the official Neapolitan engravers w was allowed right. to issue a reproduction of any item in the Port de Chief And museum. one reason that, looks, that plate looks a bit odd is that he had it second hand. You weren't allowed to sketch in the museum. So right. this is a plate, it's a, it's a memory of an object. But by putting them together and publishing them, he's making a sort of pan-Italian statement based mm -hmm. on the Roman heritage 
you know, we take this for granted, but it wasn't taken for granted in his day. The other, the other way to answer the political and religious question is to invoke a project that none of us actually talked about today, but it's in the exhibition, which is his very beautiful project drawings for the Lateran. Uh, you know, we know it as one of the great churches in Rome, but any contemporary viewer seeing that Piranesi made, uh, in a sense, transformation of the, of the greatest you know, <coughs> in Rome would have connected it with papal uh, authority. The Lateran is the seat of the papacy. The Pope is Pope because he is Bishop of Rome, not of St. Peter's. St. Peter's is there for convenience, but Lateran is the seat of the, of the, of the sea. And so Piranesi is intervening at the very most poignant part of all of Roman religious architecture, in a sense, and with a very papalist agenda mm -hmm. in that building. And even from a passive point of view, politically, vis-a-vis -vis Piranesi, it's no accident that um, more than one pope actually gave his images to visitors. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a deliberate choice. There were other options. He could sure. have given them a panini, uh, one of the paintings that I showed you, or, sure. or a small suite of them, or micro mosaics, which were also another uh, sort of small uh, Which they did. They, 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 did did yeah. they did that, one too. They did that, too. One of the things to keep in mind, too, is, is, is the text that goes along with these plates. I mean, we, we tend to think yeah, of them just as a true. series of pictures, but there are arguments texts. Yeah. They're illustrations to an argumentative text in many cases, okay. and, and so they, they fit together and, and, and promote this idea of the magnificence of Rome in a way that a Panini might not. And the textual image is important because um, almost everywhere in Europe where you could buy a Piranesi print, this, these were done through booksellers and bookshops, not through art dealers and antiquarian dealers and things like that. So the connection between book publishing and these types of images is very, very strong. The chimney piece book that I invoked was published with a, a text in Italian, in French, and in English. This gives you some idea of his audience. Maybe one more question? Over here, I think. Oh, do you have a question? I'm sorry, Lisa. You have the mic, so we'll go here and then over here. To take away someone else's question, the microphone here. In the exhibit and the front page of our program is a view of the Capitolio. How do you say it? No. The carceri. Actually, we, there's a disconnect there. Um, oh. This is a view of the carceri. Um, yes. We have seen a view of the Capitolio today, but um, that is not it. But this, my question is the, about the, how do you say it? Car the, the prisons. The prisons. This seems, I mean, it's a big deal in the exhibit, but it seems kind of out of context for, but you're going to tell me why it's not. Of everything we've seen today, why was this important to him and what was the importance of this? Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I mean, we, we probably should have had a fourth paper by someone who just wanted to deal with the car today. Um, but then you would never get to eat lunch. Uh, you're talk, aren't you talking about these later? Um, Give a preview. Uh, 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 yes. Um, although because I'm talking about them, I think I'd rather not give all of that away. So I'm going to pitch this over to, to the three of you. And, and, and I'm interested in hearing why, why you think he took on the card city. Well, I'll speak first because I have the least to say <laughs> about I have never understood the card tree. I've never, I don't get it. Yeah, I just, I've never really been able to conceptualize it in a way that connects to other things about Piranesi that I know into a broader uh, type of context. Do I recognize their importance as sort of a window into his artistic imagination? Absolutely. I've recently heard an argument about how they represent enlightenment, how the earlier ones are quite dark and then he opens up windows, literally letting light come into these uh, type of spaces. Penology in Italy was one of its major contributions to the enlightenment, the reform of uh, prisons, the idea of rehabilitation as opposed to punishment. Uh, Cesare Beccaria from Milan uh, will, is the major um, exponent of that. But as images themselves, I've never, I really have never been able to, to integrate them into uh, the type of things that, that I know something about. They're, and to me, they're highly enigmatic. Well, if, if I might pick up from there, I think it's precisely that um, aspect of them that uh, gives them their great power. Um, and so first, I think it's important to um, recognize that they, they come relatively early in his career. And in a certain sense, they make his career. They establish his career. Uh, but secondly, 
they, 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 they represent for me, and I think for him, the fusion of his early Venetian experiences in the theater and in set design mm. with his earlier, his, his early and extremely formative uh, experiences in ancient Roman architecture, particularly subterranean Roman architecture. And the combination of these two allows him to, uh, and, and filtered somehow through this remarkable brain and then through his hand and the etching needle and transferred onto the two-dimensional surface of the plate, allows him, I would say, to tell stories, to tell extraordinary, marvelous stories that uh, almost ev each viewer will interpret differently, uh, projecting some measure of him or herself into it. And for me, one of the great um, experiences of the exhibition is the, uh, is the video, which actually, I think, uh, recognizes the, this narrative quality to them and allows one, uh, the, the, the viewer of the, of the video, to move from one of these irrational spaces to another. Um, they are a remarkable achievement, um, and, and I think that's why they, they, they remain central to, um, to, to Piranesi. Do I have my turn? <laughs> Adam Lowe showed yesterday evening a beautiful uh, stage design by one of the Bibiena family of sonographers. And it, it made it very clear that in, in, their, in these, these prisons' first formulation in the late 40s, some of the motifs, the drawbridges and the, the catwalks and this kind of thing, they come very, very directly from um, conventions of stage design in which prisons obviously feature backdrops for operas are often set, you know, there's a prison scene. I mean, it's a kind of a convention in a way. And I think that that's the visual language in which this began. But I, I think what's emerging, in fact, the, the image that you have is not from that early edition. It's from the much later reworking where he went back and I think they became something different for him. They became a, a mental space of, of, of play. Um, and I think it relates to the two points that I think John and Christopher were making. One is that it inserts the viewer in this space. This is not something glimpsed through a window. You're, you're in there and you're, everything that, that John said so beautifully about how Piranesi's views walk you through the building and encourage you to, to be in the structure, to be enclosed by the space. This is exactly what he's working out here and that I think is what the video brings out. And then there's also the question of scale because I had a teacher who, before I ever went to Rome, uh, told me that really what these are, they're, they're um, elaborations of the, the Mamertine prison, where it was believed at the foot of the, sort of the forum, where the apostles were imprisoned before their martyrdom. So I duly went to the Mamertine prison and expected to see these. And <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's a small room with uh, some bold masonry and, you know, but it, it told me something about Piranesi. He went, in a sense, from that, which he certainly would have known, one of the tourist sites of Rome to this, and that is what his art is about. Yeah, I, I mean, so much of his art is a response to existing things. For me, I, I sort of see them as a place of taking that, the, the language of the caprice, the study of the magnificence, the fascination with scale, and creating something that's so over the top, in a sense, that it's freed from the burden of being a building. It is a place of imagination. I think you can go further with that. I think you can make a, a kind of parallel to the beginnings of the Gothic novel and the work of someone like Horace Walpole, who knew and admired Piranese, and it's part of this bigger 18th century phenomenon of the, the Enlightenment and its, and its dark side, uh, a kind of romantic reaction. You can, he, there are a million different ways to interpret. He even changes the title between the two editions. Yeah. The yeah. first one is basically Invenzioni Capricciosi di Carceri, you know, like cap capricious ideas for prisons. And the second one is Carceri di Invenzione, which is probably best translated as Prisons of the Imagination, yeah. which is already a kind of metaphorical, you're meant to think about in what, 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 what is being imprisoned in here. It's right. very interesting. Perhaps one last question. impressed by his uh, genius and all the creativity. However, I find one thing I want to, to ponder on that. In all his work, I feel it's a wanting of, um, what do I say, humanity. In other words, no emotion. It's totally 
intellectual product. So all his work, even, even, even the prison, let's say, it doesn't involve any human uh, ish, uh, element in there. That's what my impression, you know, it's all on the, it's art, art plus intellectual kind of artwork rather than emotional. In other words, hmm. it, to me, I don't know if it's the correct point or not, but uh, that is my, one of my... I think it's not a view shared by the 18th century observers of Piranesi who, who had, I think, the opposite view. They, they thought he was led astray by his emotional sensitivities. Yeah, I mean, to, and, to, and show, to so show buildings repeatedly. in this way, from these strange low <clears throat> viewpoints, um, to emphasize the shadowy, ruined quality, that, that was different from the more objective, intellectually rigorous traditions of depicting architecture. Uh, so I think he would have been seen as a great, uh, greatly and emotional was. character. Uh, awed by his uh, express, uh, representation. No, so impressed. It's, but I'm not, uh, let's say, emotionally touched. That's, anyway, it's... I, if, I, if I could just respond uh, briefly, I, 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 I see your point. Um, there, I, th I think the, there's, a, uh, there's a different vocabulary for the emotions uh, with Piranesi, and it is very much a vocabulary of um, brick and mortar and stone. Uh, but don't neglect when you go around the exhibition and look at the, um, uh, at the prints, the, the considerable population of figures in those prints. Um, just to give you one example, there are 134 figures in the frontal view of the Fontana di Trevi. Uh, but more to the point, when you, go to, yeah. <laughs> when you go to, the, to, to look at the carchery, um, the uh, reclining figure um, over the, uh, the title page is, for me, one of the most um, emotionally charged figures uh, in, all of, in, in all of Western art with these haunting, uh, deep uh, eye sockets. Uh, so I, 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 I take your point and, um, and, and I share it, but I think it is possible to find the emotion uh, in, in Piranesi's graphic work. I think maybe uh, in terms of, of difference in vocabulary, maybe uh, we just call these things different things than they did in the 18th century. I look at it in terms of that emotionality, and I see it too, um, as more the idea of sensibility as opposed to sense in the Jane Austen sense. You know, the, the sense is sort of the rational world. The sensibility is the ability to transcend that in order to, to touch the realm of the imagination and the sublime. So in that sense, the emotion is under control, but it basically is a superior form of thinking to the idea of simply following the rules and doing everything according to the formula. Well, I think on the notion that we should all go back and look again at the prints, um, I'll, I'll call the proceedings to an end. Read Jane, Austen. read Jane Austen, read Horace Walpole, look at a few prints. Um, thank you all. You've been a very patient audience. <laughs>